The Mogcast, a fortnightly conversation with Jacob Rees-Mogg about the topics of the day. Welcome to the 74th Mogcast. This is Paul Goodman, editor of Conservative Home in conversation with Jacob Rees-Mogg. Jacob, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Paul. Thank you for coming in. Here we are. And before the listeners hear my introduction, they hear a generic form of words each week, which is that I'll be talking to you about the issues of the day. And there's only one issue of the day this week, which is the war. So what I thought we'd try and do in this conversation, since exploring the implications of the war for Russia, Western Europe in the world, I think is so complicated a task, it's probably best left, is just to uh, look ahead at what the implications for Britain might be. So I want for a start to assume that if there isn't a, a swift coup, or a swift Russian withdrawal, or a swift negotiated settlement, this war will go on for some time, and that if it does, there will be consequences for politics here and the way we live. Do you think that's right? Yes, I do. Um, That a number of the things that are happening in Ukraine and because of the Russian invasion of Ukraine exacerbate trends that were already occurring. I'm thinking, obviously, of the cost of living crisis. So um, you've got the rise in the oil price that has been very steep already. Um, Closed the end of last week at nearly $120 a barrel. And bear in mind, uh, at the low point at the beginning of COVID, uh, it was in negative territory. People actually pay you to take a barrel of oil. So the change in price over two years is extraordinary. The price of um, petrol and diesel at the pumps has gone up accordingly. But it's the threat to Odessa, which is the main port through which uh, a lot of the grain grown in Ukraine flows out to the rest of the world, that the Ukraine supplies a very large amount of surplus grain. I believe it supplies foodstuffs for 600 million people. And so if you take that out of the supply chain or you reduce the amount that's coming into the supply chain, then you would expect wheat prices particularly to be affected, and that feeds through to a cost of living crisis in terms of food prices. You've already seen the price of fertilizer increase significantly. So that, if the inputs of food production are going up, then the outputs will be more expensive. So it makes life more expensive. Let's come back to the cost of living <clears throat> later. It is a sort of huge theme, and just trying to think about discrete areas of policy. So let's just start with defence. Um, do you think as a consequence of this, we are going to have to spend more, a higher percentage of our GDP, whatever, on defence? Well, I, I think everyone is going to be re-examining the basis on which they organise their uh, defence expenditure. We've already seen a big increase promised by the Germans. We had the strategic review, what was it, two years ago, Um, and it noted that Russia was the greatest threat to us. But I don't think at that point we thought that Russia would be using ground troops in Europe. So I think there are inevitably cost pressures that come from this. I think the answer to that question, broadly speaking, was was yes. Uh, You mentioned the strategic review. You're quite right in saying that the review, it said very plainly that um, uh, Russia was the main military threat in our own theatre, which is the European theatre. But since then, we've also dabbled with, um, for example, sending a ship to the South China Sea. There's been lots of discussion about pivot to um, the Pacific and so on. Um, Do you think that as part of this defence revision um, to which you referred will require a larger army? I don't know. Um, And I'm not trying to avoid your question, but I'm not an expert in that type of military tactic. What I can't tell you is whether more things can be done remotely. We hear drones have been operating very effectively uh, in Ukraine. I don't know whether more can be done with the more sophisticated equipment that is actually operated from bases rather than having large land armies. Um, So... so I'm simply not enough of an expert to answer that question. 
I don't think it's a simple answer because whatever happens, we are not moving back to the conscript armies of the First and Second World War. It seems to me it's inconceivable that those would ever be useful in the way they were in the First and Second World War, that the warfare has changed, but the precise degree to which it's changed and the precise numbers that you need is not something I'm qualified to answer. Just going back a step, I think we're broadly agreed that everyone, that's the UK included, is going to have to spend more on defence. Can I come next to um, energy policy? I mean, in, in simple terms, there are really three legs to the energy policy stool. I mean, one is keeping prices affordable to consumers. Uh, another is the aim of reducing emissions. That's where net zero comes in. And the third is security of supply. Have we been doing enough to ensure security of supply? Um, I, I think the predominant interest in the last couple of years has been net zero. Which is a way of saying that we ought to redress the balance to think more about security of supply. Well, what we have done, you, you will remember there were criticisms that we don't have enough storage and that other countries have lots of storage. The reason we never had lots of storage was quite deliberate because we had it stored in the North Sea. Um, but there have been some recent instances where we haven't accessed our own storage because we haven't got permission from the regulator to get it out. That needs to change. We need to use the resources that we have got. Do you think we need to do more to um, encourage those who can to get more out of the North Sea, even if that has a knock-on effect on net zero? Well, it seems to me it doesn't have a knock-on effect in the net zero, that it is more environmentally friendly to use gas that you've got immediately at hand than to import gas uh, in um, liquefied or uh, liquefied form from other parts of the world. It's, it's very hard to see why that is more environmentally friendly. I, I think we've sort of had the, the, the green blob has had the view that UK energy is bad uh, in principle and that therefore it's better to bring it in from elsewhere. I've never seen the logic of that. Okay, so um, I think it's pretty clear you're saying that we should look again at extracting more from the North Sea and that it's more environmentally friendly in any event than importing. Yes. Um, should we be looking again at fracking? Well, shale gas uh, is very clean gas, as we know, um, but in um, uh, net zero terms, uh, shale gas has helped the US enormously to cut its um, carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, the Conservative Party manifesto said that uh, we wouldn't do it unless it was shown that it was safe to do. And the question is, is it safe to do? And they get into discussions about earthquakes. And I think the issue here is that people hear about um, uh, two on the Richter scale and think it's the San Francisco earthquake, which of course it isn't because it's a logarithmic scale. Uh, and you've got to have, a, I think, a sense of proportion about what the seismic activity is. I, I think... For example, there was a great report in 2012 um, by the Royal Society of the Royal Geographical Society that pointed out that um, a fall of, of rock in a disused coal mine is more than you get from most fracking instances. So I think this is what needs to be looked at to see if we can meet the terms of the 2019 manifesto. you suggesting that concern about earthquakes is essentially overdone and that earthquakes is being used as a kind of portmanteau term for seismic events that are actually a lot smaller and don't cause any really substantial disturbance? Well, some of the seismic effects are ones that can only be measured with sophisticated equipment. Uh, others are equivalent to a bus passing by your uh, house, assuming there's a pavement in between you and the, and the house. And as I say, it's not the San Francisco earthquake. Moving on to food, do you think um, we have the balance right between food security, producing enough um, to suffice um, in a crisis or insurance against a crisis and importing food from abroad? Well, we haven't produced our own food in any form of living memory. I don't think we've probably produced our own food without imports of a significant kind back to the middle of the 19th century. I don't know the precise date. But if you think of the Second World War, in the Second World War, uh, the reason we had to have rationing was because the supplies couldn't get through and the shipping was restricted um, because of the um, obvious difficult shipping is in certain new boat activity. So we are not going to go to a situation of producing all our own food. We just aren't. 
The question is, do we have sufficient currently to maintain basic needs, or can you foresee a circumstance where um, uh, access to global markets is going to be fundamentally impaired? So Ukraine, um, coming out of supply potentially, has a knock-on effect because it puts prices up which will probably encourage farmers to plant more marginal land. So there is, to some extent, a market forces argument. Um, you're asking the broader question, I think, underpinning it, of where should our subsidies go? How should they be paid to farmers and should they be related to food? The difficulty with relating to them to food is that when the EU did that, it created huge food mountains. So that wasn't a very successful policy. On the other hand, when you're facing a shortage of supply and rising prices, offering farmers money not to produce food seems to have other difficult consequences. So in an ideal world, the more of a market solution you have, the better. But so you might have to shift subsidies away from not producing food uh, as a hedge against not having well, enough food uh, in a world in which supplies of food are suddenly endangered. You may not necessarily need to do anything in terms of policy because if the price of wheat goes up, farmers will not want to be paid to move out of food because they will make money from producing food. So you may, may, you may not need to do any change in policy. You may still want to um, carry on with planting more trees and all sorts of other things of that kind, but simple market forces will mean that farmers don't do that this year. They think, well, we'll do that in another year. Do you think it makes any difference at all to the government's um, policy on trade? I mean, one of your, your ministerial colleagues said to me over the, over the weekend, said in relation to the Australian deals, they said, my farmers are going completely nuts. They're being paid a third of what they were being paid before, and they're talking of going out of business. Um, well, that's a separate question. The, the, the trade deal with Australia doesn't allow immediate competition from Australia in a wide variety of agricultural products, particularly beef and lamb. So it's a phased process. It's really important that we should be fair to consumers and give them the benefits of competitive markets. But we also have responsibility to producers who have been regulated to such an extent that they haven't been able to be free market competitors. So it's trying to get that balance right. And that, that's why I think phasing things is perfectly reasonable. And what do you think about the, the bigger picture of um, the implications for the economy of the cost of living? And it did look anyway, before this war, as though we were moving into a period of, of stagflation, of quite low growth worldwide, but also quite rapid inflation, so interest rates broadly speaking, are going to go up. It's already started, ha started happening here. How much does that cramp a chancellor's room for manoeuvre? Because the bit of popular theory um, you read in um, some of our fellow right-wing publications is um, it cut tax, borrow more, go for growth, everything will be great. How much room do you have to do that now compared to, say, a year ago, when interest rates are on an upward path? I mean, I think that the difficulty is that that approach is attractive when there is global growth and there is growth to get. It's much harder when there isn't any global growth because you then find that you just spend more money and you're into straightforward Keynesianism, which we... Keynesianism. I don't quite know how to pronounce it. Anyway, leave that to one side. I think Keynesianism is probably right. Keynesianism sounds a bit odd. Um, so you've got to be careful of that easy approach. Um, I mean, I, th I think the economic backdrop is difficult. I think you want to look at what Margaret Thatcher did, because there's a lot to learn from that. And it fits in with my role, which is why I quite like talking about it. This is supply side reforms. Where do you get growth in a global economy that isn't growing that rapidly? You get it from making your own economy more efficient. And that means taking away the burdens, the obstacles, the hindrances to growth. And um, that is looking at regulation. It's looking at um, non-tariff barriers to trade. It's looking at 
things that um, make consumers' lives more difficult. It's looking at the work of the Competitions and Markets Authority to see if it is focusing on making things better for consumers. It's looking at civil service efficiency. Are we spending taxpayers' money well? Let's look at that supply-side change, a lot of which I remember happened under Nigel Lawson. In the general context of what Margaret Thatcher did, related to the Chancellor's May lecture last week, mm -hmm. and the Chancellor made a case, it's not been uh, popular among all of your colleagues, or indeed among all of my colleagues in the right-wing press, that um, sometimes um, taxes have to rise now. I thought that the Chancellor's version of history was broadly right, because in her early days, I mean, Margaret Thatcher did some tax cuts early on, she cut income tax, put VAT up. Her main preoccupation was getting interest rates down when the crunch came in 1981. And to do that, she had to put in fairly substantial tax rises. So admittedly, Interest rates then were complicated by North Sea oil putting upward pressure on the currency and on rates. But keeping interest rates down, sounds ironic after we've had a long period of them being very low, but keeping them down in the current situation will be very important to economic growth, won't it? I mean, I think the analysis of what Margaret Thatcher did is fascinating, but it's not always about keeping interest rates down. If you bear in mind um, the medium-term financial strategy with a targeted money supply figure, which was always overshot, interest rates were kept high to try and bring the money supply under control because that was seen as the great begetter of inflation. Inflation was the main enemy. Everything Margaret Thatcher was doing was to get inflation under control so that the economy could grow in a sustainable way, which is exactly what she achieved, and that fitted in with the supply side reforms that were going on <clears throat> and the privatisations that were bringing efficiency to government activity. But you're quite right, the tax burden under Margaret Thatcher uh, reaches almost the highest level as its forecast to reach now. Uh, and the first budget, 1979 budget, um, unifies the VAT rate, and everyone thinks it was going to be unified at a middle rate. And lo and behold, it's unified at a higher rate than the lot. It goes to 15%. So yes, she attached great importance to balancing the books. Um, but she was pushing ahead very forcefully with the supply side reforms, as we've discussed before, particularly in terms of labour markets and the trade union reforms that were necessary. And um, it, a lesson you might argue that you'd learn from that early Thatcher period isn't that you have um, tax cuts and you let borrowing go where it will, but that tax cuts and public spending control march in step. So we may be moving towards a period where we have to do the same again, coupled with the kind of supply side reform to which you're referring. But well, you've got to keep spending under control. There's always pressure within every aspect of government to increase spending. Um, uh, I'm having a notice put up outside my office quoting Gladstone of all people about um, candle ends and cheese pairings. Candle ends and cheese pairings are the interest of government because if we keep those under control, then you take the burden off taxpayers. Can I ask where um, all this is going in terms of another effect of the war, uh, in terms of refugees and migration? And there was a enormous um, wave of um, concern in many parts of the countries last year about small boats. Everyone knows um, that a kind of new means of arriving has been found. How much of it was to do with COVID closing off other routes, we don't know. There's a very large increase in the number of small boats coming across the channel. It is a big issue for substantial groups of voters. How is this going to interact? with a massive refugees coming west from the Ukraine who will be looking to get out and get anywhere. I mean, it's surely possible to, to see a kind of very bad um, uh, potential policy collision, as it were, between masses of desperate Ukrainians trying to get into the West and the rise of small boats here. Do you think that's a realistic worry? What do you think should be done? I think the British people are fundamentally generous to genuine refugees. I think what upset them about the small boats is actually these were 
people illegally pe people trafficked. And it was trying, the, 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 the reaction to small boats is about trying to stop crime and recognizing that most of the people who come through those routes are male uh, who have paid people track because a good deal of money to do it. What we're seeing from Ukraine is that it's mainly women and children who are leaving. Um, and I think the British people are generous, uh, as with the offer to the people of Hong Kong, which has been a very popular policy. There's been no real opposition to it. Uh, and I think has led already to tens of thousands of applications, I think 100,000 applications, that I don't want to swear to the figure. And I, so I think the British people are generous. I think they believe in offering refuge to people fleeing from places of grave danger. Um, and the two routes that are currently uh, available show that, that the government's got the message about what the British people want. Does this mean a, a higher level of migration overall, or uh, do numbers have to be reduced elsewhere in order to accommodate the larger number of refugees uh, and arrivals from Hong Kong who are going to come? Well, I, I, I think there, there's no cap on the numbers coming from Ukraine, and I think that's important and right. Um, but time will tell. We have, you know, this is at a very early stage in the crisis. It's been going for under two weeks so far. Um, yes, there's been a large number of refugees who have left Ukraine so far, but most of them will want to go back because they will want to rebuild their country. That the patriotism of the Ukrainian people is awe inspiring, isn't it? Isn't it amazing to see how people are willing to take risks for their own country, the love they have for their country. Um, the scene in the House of Commons when the uh, Ukrainian ambassador was there was um, remarkable, really, as a sign of respect to the patriotism of the Ukrainian people. So it's so early to say where this crisis will end up, but is it the instinct of the British people to be generous? Yes, of course it is, and so it should be. I want to come to patriotism in a moment. I just wanted to try to nail this point down about migration, because before COVID, uh, migration was was running at a net plus again. What had happened was, um, broadly speaking, fewer people were coming in from the European Union and more people were coming in from, from outside. That's where the, yeah, the, well, the well, policy was point, settling. Up, up to point, there is a difficulty with this is that um, the ONS didn't actually have any idea how many people were here from the European Union. So if you think we thought there would be 3 million applying for settled status, because that's how many that we thought it'd come, it turned out to be 6 million. So we didn't actually know. And I hope that we have more reliable statistics. We probably do, because um, if you're coming in, now we're outside the European Union, you have to have a, a, a visa and have made a proper application. Um, but we were just guessing at the numbers previously. Certainly there's been an increase in the number of people who are coming in from outside the European Union. So um, I'm simply suggesting that it's, if, you, if you add all this up, add Hong Kong arrivals, plus massive people coming in from Ukraine, plus larger numbers coming in from outside the EU, plus whatever you have coming from the EU, uh, it may well be that we have taken back control, but we're actually having higher numbers of, of migration growth than we were having before. But it's always been the case that um, we should have control. It was always about much more than numbers. It was about who decides, who makes these choices about where people come from. And on patriotism, just let's sort of finish off here, there's been a sort of debate um, going on in the media over the last week about whether Western decadence, as it were, has fueled Putin's appeasement. All sorts of bits of uh, apparent or claimed evidence being thrown into the, onto the debating floor. I mean, some people have raised, I saw one columnist do it in the, um, in the, in the Sunday Times yesterday, uh, raised, um, uh, who who goes uh, into which set of public conveniences in terms of the debate on trans people? Someone else raised um, uh, MI6, I think, um, um, you know, putting the the, the the rainbow flag up or the badge on its t Twitter account. All sorts of stuffs being dragged into this debate about um, uh, whether or not. Um, our uh, approach to life has become sort of somewhat trivialised 
and that this war um, will provide a greater sense of perspective. And what do you think about all that? I think there's something in it. Um, on the day that Russia invaded Ukraine, the Daily Mail front page recorded that, um, I assume it was accurate, uh, MI5, MI6 and GCHQ had said that you shouldn't use the word manpower and grip and one other, I forget what the other was, it might have been strong. And you think, what are they doing? That's not their job to faff around with this sort of stuff. They're there to keep the country safe. And that this distraction, this time used on essentially trivial stuff has not been an indication of backbone. If you were, if you were Putin and you thought, what sort of response am I going to get from the UK? And you saw they're worrying about whether you used the word grip, you thought they didn't have a grip. So I don't think this should be ignored completely. But I wouldn't, you know, ultimately we have got backbone. Uh, and we always have when push comes to shove. So it's 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 um, it was silly, and let's hope the silliness is over. Jacob Rees-Mogg, thank you very much for this week's modcast, um, and let's hope the world's in better shape. Um, hoping against hope, perhaps, uh, for when we meet in a fortnight. Thank you very much. The modcast. A fortnightly conversation with Jacob Rees-Mogg about the topics of the day.